Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Phil Johnston. Phil is the founder and vice president of Fenris Electric Systems. Uh, Fenris makes uh, inspection drones for the commercial sector, uh, mainly utility companies, and also does contract engineering and product development services, uh, software and hardware. Phil, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah, it's good to be here. Good to have you. Um, so we just jumped on a call for work, like maybe a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about maybe getting into something, and you had some really, really good stories and interesting insights, and when some of the stuff you told me you worked on. And when we started, I wasn't thinking about the podcast, but by the end, I was like, man, this guy should be on the podcast. So I'm really glad you took me up on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a uh, it's been a lot of fun being in the drone industry. There's you know. A lot of change always happening, and there's a lot of uh, interesting technologies moving along. That's awesome. How'd you get into the drone space? Actually, uh, I've always loved wireless video and anything robotic. So I built my first RC airplane with wireless video in 2002, and that's been my core hobby and background ever since. So my wife is <laughs> very patient with me. I, I have probably 30 air, airplanes and drones in my basement with wireless video on them and autopilots and so it's a lot of uh, a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I'm similar. I um, I'm just accumulating robots, and it's it's a huge money pit. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's a labor of love for sure. Yeah. Yep. There. Uh, once you get your hands on some, you you always think of other options and ideas. So you don't want to just get rid of them. You know. Absolutely, and it's kind of. I think every robotics company or like you know professional that you know sort of practitioners has like a collection of robots they've worked on over the years that they sort of build up and i've tried to get better about putting old ones into storage instead of just keeping them around cluttering up the offices but sometimes <laughs> it's, just, it's hard to go around without tripping over something so i can i can relate yeah that's exactly how it is there's uh too many of them but then you know i kind of cycle through each one has their own particular use case or or you know, strength over the others. So then I'll actually pull them out of storage and re revitalize them with new technology and go test. Oh, that's cool. So what are some of the, uh, some of the interesting ones you got? Like what, what do you walk me through some of the classics? So probably one of the most classic is the, it's a high wing, uh, electric plane, all balsa wood. I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of the senior telemaster, but it's a, it's a German, uh, balsa wood, classic plane. So we got a full Ardu pilot Pixhawk installed on there with wireless video. It's an eight foot wingspan aircraft, a lot of fun, uh, very gentle, slow flying. And of course, there's a lot of custom multirotors. They're very small race, race multirotors, typically 250 class, uh, 80 miles an hour, you know, just a lot of fun for, for uh, ripping around a field. What does the 250 class refer to? It's the, uh, the weight. Oh, cool. So 250 grams. Yeah. Okay, cool. What happens if yep. it weighs 260 grams? Can it not be a 250 class anymore? The FAA actually has a, uh, a rule uh, about anything 250 grams or lighter. It oh. doesn't have to be tracked. So. That's interesting. So if it's 260, it's illegal. But if it's 240, it can still be a 250 class. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So you can be lighter, but you're, you're, you're basically just staying under that regulation. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I've definitely seen drones bigger than that, but I feel like those are probably all like licensed commercial, you know, like something or other for, for a work purpose. Yeah. Hobby, hobby drones, um, can be a lot bigger of course. And then commercial use, you know, if you have your FAA part 107 license, you know, some of the drones that I've flown were 18 pounds, you know, you're talking the bigger DJI M600 with LIDAR units on board, you know, bigger payloads, uh, other, other, uh, Rotary, you know, rotary wing and, and uh, multi-rotors. 
That's cool. And then for a fixed wing, it's not restricted the same way it sounds like from that eight foot wingspan one you've got. That's just hobby level. Um, so yeah, you're still supposed to register any aircraft that you fly that's uh, unmanned if it's over 250 grams. Okay, so that one's just registered or yep. it's supposed to be. <laughs> cool. Yeah, no worries. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to get you in trouble. Just just trying to learn the uh, the field. So no, that's cool. Um, so I guess I sort of asked earlier, but I, I didn't, I don't know that we went super into it. And if you want me to go away from this, we can, but how'd you get into drones? Like initially, like what was, what led you to sort of buy in the first one or getting your license initially or working with, I don't know. What was, what was your path into this, into this sector? Yeah, I ended up moving from Michigan to Washington in 2007 Cool. And, and this is Washington State for people listening, not yep. D.C. Yeah, Washington State. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, obviously, uh, Hood River is right there, and they call it the Drone Mecca. Institute is there, of course, and, and uh, quite a few others. And so I went to college and ended up getting in with cloud kept technology out in Hood River. Cool. So they manufacture gimbals and autopilots, and that was my chance to really start working on higher-end equipment and move from, you know, all my hobby grade equipment into actual, you know, mission specific equipment. And then from there, I ended up eventually after, you know, quite an adventure of, of multiple companies out here in the West Coast, I moved to Maryland and got in with a utility contractor and they actually rebuild the utility lines. They have, I don't know, 140 guys. So they are, uh, you know, they, they travel up and down Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and I was creating running in the drone department there. So that's where I actually started flying drones commercially. Oh, well, that's cool. So what did you get asked to create the drone department? Did you just come up with it? And someone was like, ah, all right, kid, whatever. We'll give you, you know, 30,000 bucks. And you know, if you make it work, great. And if not, you're fired. Or like, how, how do you how do you end up going down that road? So my brother's been at that company for 10 years as a lineman. And I know the owners from way back. And they had bought a couple of these smaller DJI drones and flew them around and saw the value. But, you know, if you don't have somebody in charge of it that's taking ownership and has a vision and a plan, then they get they get crashed and shoved in the closet and it just stalls out, that which is what sense. happened there. So I ended up reaching out to them and saying, hey, let's talk. And they said, we want you to you know, run this whole inspection department, create it, you know, from scratch. And, and, uh, and then... I'll fly internally for the company, you know, for bidding and estimating and, and safety analysis, and then also go out and and fly for a revenue stream. So actually, inspections for hire, basically. Oh, cool. So that was that was where that went, and it was a lot of fun. So was that were you doing contracting to that company, or they hired you full time to create an in house department? I'm just kind of curious. Oh yeah, they hired me full time. Uh, so we actually packed packed my family from Washington State and moved across the U S. and and came on full time at that contractor and and was there for almost four years. Oh, cool! That's awesome. And because like your brother and they they kind of knew you already, they were just like, "Yeah, you can, you're ready. Like, just head it up, make it work." You know, we're sick of these drones getting crashed. Yeah, yep. They knew my background with yeah. with uh, drones and all kinds of aircraft, and and figured I could uh, you know navigate the world of the FAA and commercial pilot license, uh, drone pilots license you know, reg regulations and, and actually go, you know, provide value. So that was, yeah, that sense. was a lot of fun. You know, creating something from scratch and, and, uh, and doing something that other utility contractors were not doing. That's awesome. And I mean, I, I've seen it a little bit, but you're right. There's not that many companies that can do that. I think even now that I know of, I mean, you would know more than me. Is that like becoming a more saturated space, like the utility drone inspection market, or is it still pretty niche and like, scarce to find people that know how to do that or, or like are comfortable flying around those utilities what's yeah what well, what i think is probably the most interesting thing is that the utilities themselves are bringing on or creating their own drone department internally which to me makes a lot of sense you know it's like a like a cordless drill it's very powerful everybody should have one if you're in some kind of construction so these guys you know everything they do is overhead or underground which I have a story about underground too with utilities, but anyway, sure. yeah, like they, they should have this, uh, you know, at least one drone with the, with the thermal and digital camera on it. And, and their trouble men can go out and say, Hey, you know, this particular section of line had an outage last night for a second. It's called a reclosure event. And it means that momentarily it shut off and turned back on and, and they can go fly that line, that quarter mile line or wherever they, they heard or saw the system problem. And with that aerial vantage, 
they can really get a good idea. Did a branch fall on the line? Do we see a, uh, you know, maybe there's a turkey vulture that landed on a pole and got between the phases or whatever it is and, and sorted that line out, you know, and so now they can actually get a lot better visual. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing that, but utility contractors are, are not. That's interesting. So to go back a step, I heard the word troubleman. I hadn't heard that before, but is that just what it sounds like? Like the person that figures out what is causing trouble? Yeah, yep. It's usually <laughs> a very experienced lineman, uh, you cool. know, for most utilities, and and they send they you know they send them out on a truck to go inspect an area, and that they can see that there's a there was trouble, you know, and then that's his, his <laughs> role, role to find out what it is. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's really really cool. Um, yeah, it's it's fun. I, I have a mentor who's pretty into power electronics, and uh, he was telling me about reclosures a little bit so it's apparently it's a feature of the system like if a branch falls to try to zap it off by mm -hmm. turning it off and on um is that so the reclosures are like by design it's supposed to do that but you still want to figure out what caused it in the first place because there's probably some kind of lingering issue even if you blasted yeah. whatever caused it off like now you got to clean up a vulture carcass or a branch or something exactly yeah and you want to make sure that it's not because of you know, maybe the pole is broken and it's sagging and, you know, it's, there's a there's wind swinging the branches into it and it's occasionally causing this. And you have a much bigger problem than just a, you know, random little reclicker event. And, you know, maybe sometimes it is just a small random event because just a branch falls from a tree and then it successfully blows it off, you know, blows it up by that, you know, turning the power off and on a couple of times and clears the line and life goes on. It's actually designed for that, you know, so that it doesn't just shut the whole thing down permanently or until it, you know, there's a deep investigation, it just automatically tries to, you know, recharge the line a few times until, until it's actually usually three or four times. If it doesn't, if it doesn't hold after that, then they know there's a bigger problem and, and it doesn't keep trying. That's interesting. It just shuts down at that point or? Yeah. Yep. It yeah. just stays, stays turned off. That makes sense. So it fails to on, you might cook something or cause a fire or could create a bigger problem, I would think. Yeah, they're seeing like this super high uh, current spike and they know either there's a branch or, you know, the poles fallen over or, this, you know, some sometimes terrible things happen where people with very high uh, excavators or cranes have swung their boom right into it and it's <laughs> just directly shorting and they don't want to keep, you know, keep power onto that. It'll burn that thing down and, you know, cause all kinds of trouble. So you, they have to, yeah, at some point they have to stop recharging the line and go out and investigate. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Drones are really good for after a windstorm when you saw some of those events to go patrol the area and actually see, you know, are the lines damaged uh, or is there still branches overhanging or is there a, a whole tree <laughs> laying right on the lines and it's just, you know, just about to, to arc on into another phase, but thankfully it's not right at the moment, you know, which that can happen. You know, it's definitely something that happens. So I got called to go out a few times and actually inspect the lines, like 20 mile circuits around Washington, D.C., after a windstorm, uh, just to go look at this this whole circuit and verify it was good because they saw multiple events during that windstorm. That's interesting. So what'd you find like when you went out there? You know, that particular one, I, I never found anything wrong with it. Uh, I did I did see some heavier branches down below that looked fresh. Uh, you know, literally flew the drone down within six feet of the of the ground above the branches and took some pictures and oh, cool. tried to investigate for burn marks and so on. Uh, and then came back and but really looking close at every structure and every conductor to make sure there wasn't any damage that they have to go and actually roll a crew and repair. That's good. So to be good at that, then, you not only have to know how to fly a drone like pretty damn well, I would think, but then you also have to know what to look for in the uh, utility infrastructure and actually understand, you know, like sort of the, the background of the field that you're, you're going into makes sense. Yeah, that was a that was a huge learning curve for me, and I still I'm barely scratching the surface of that world because I've never worked as a lineman. But thankfully, I had hundreds of linemen around me to help me uh, at any given time. You know, they would come with me in the field, or they would review the data afterwards, and they would notice things right away that I I would never notice because I didn't have the background. But that's how I relied on that internal expertise to get yeah. good data to my customer. My job is similar, right? Because I mean we do contract engineering and I, I go into domains that, you know, oftentimes I've never been in. And I ask a lot of what people consider to be stupid questions on the front end. They're like, what does this acronym mean? Or, 
you know, a lot of times yeah. there's jargon in every industry that's so unique to that industry and people say words and, and acronyms and, you know, you're just like, uh, I don't know what that means. Can you just find, you know, <laughs> what that is? And they're like, ah, you idiot. And then, you know, you figure out a few things they couldn't figure out. And they're like, oh, you're, you're not an idiot. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yep. That was definitely uh first couple of years. It was endless jargon and terms that I'd never heard of uh, without ever having worked in the utility industry. So yeah, I, I definitely was asking questions. Like I got into a habit of just immediately, if I heard something, I didn't have a clue what it was. I just wait, stop. What was that? You nice. <laughs> It was uh, it was good. Man, after my own heart. Yeah, that's that's what you're supposed to do. And I think like a lot of people are afraid to like look like they don't know because I don't know what it is. Like I don't know if it's just fear of like losing your job or somebody might not think you're competent or like I don't know why people feel the need to like pretend like they know what stuff means when they don't. But I. I I feel like I've been in, you know, like meetings where I've asked what a term meant and like the other person didn't know either, you know, but they were using the term and I'm like, huh, you know, like that's, that's interesting. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just, uh, I like to, and that, I ended up realizing how little I knew, you know, really about the utility industry, like barely, barely anything about it really. And, and, and so suddenly I'm immersed in it. So I would just tell linemen and, and utility people and working with engineers. Hey, look, I'm, I'm a drone guy, not a utility guy. So I'm going to ask a lot of dumb questions. And uh, I, I really like to learn this stuff. And I really want to dive in and, and understand what we're talking about. So, you know, bear with me, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And they were always really happy. They were, you know, that was a good way to lead into it. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That's how I like to do things as well. Because if you're again, if you're willing to admit you don't know, you're gonna you're gonna figure the stuff out a lot quicker than if you're not willing to admit. You know, which yeah. case you maybe never figure it out, and you know you just pretend yeah. until you break something. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. So we had we talked a little bit last time we were on about thermal cameras, and you had some interesting. Well, actually, before we get into that, what was the underground story that you were starting to allude to, but you didn't tell yet? I, I'd, I'd be curious to to get into that first. Yeah, the, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of utilities that are overhead on poles, of course, and there's also quite a bit of utility that's buried underground. So if you look at actual distribution lines, you know, conductors that are carrying 4,000, 16,000 volts up to potentially 34,000 volts that run around underground in cities and, and big industrial centers and so on, they can't run that conductor through pipes for miles and miles. They they have to have these these underground vaults, which is where the splices are, so they can actually pull into that room and then splice to another and then continue on again, you know, usually some thousands of feet away. And and so they're called electrical vaults, and they're just a big concrete room that's buried underground, and they have a manhole. Uh, that's, that's how you access them. So typically, you would send a human down, down there. It's a three-person crew, and you have to have a special confined space permit and you have to have special PPE to do this. You have to have equipment that senses the air down below in the vault before you go to make sure there is breathable air and no explosive gases and so on. Huh. You need a, a pump to physically pump all the water out. These these vaults are always full of water. You have six, seven, eight feet of water in them. And, it's, and the splices are all insulated, so it's fine. They're designed for that. But you pump it out, and then you send somebody down there, and they inspect these splices to make sure they're not failing. And that's very dangerous sending a human in confined space underground. It's, it's not a good, With good option, but it's what we've done volts. forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's what we did for, for, you know, you know, last hundred years of, of, uh, you know, having electrical power all over in, in civilized areas. And so now with robotic technology, we don't need to send a human down there. So I actually inspected 106 underground electrical vaults by drone. So oh, cool. pop the manhole lid and fly the drone right down through underground. Oh, aerial drones, not even not even crawlers. Yeah, a flying drone. Yep. That's cool. Yeah, so that was uh, that was a lot of fun. That was where you know I was alluding with that uh, underground utility work. That's badass. I've seen. Um, I guess uh, we have a client, Red Zone Robotics, that does sewer inspections, and they use crawlers. So it's kind of kind of, and then they have robots that float uh, to do inspections on sewers which is a different kind of utility obviously but um when you said underground work i'd assumed you meant something like that that's amazing that you were able to send a flying drone down 
Yeah, it was. Uh, so, ironically, my hobby of flying, it's called FPV, which stands for per- first person view. There's a whole, you know, segment of the very niche segment of the RC hobby that does this. And what you do is basically take a real time wireless video link and you put it onto a RC car or a boat or an airplane or a drone. And you wear goggles, video goggles that get the live stream from it. And you pilot the vehicle around your neighborhood or, you know, overhead and down through barns at speed or whatever it might be <laughs> real time, like a, like a video game. And it's, cool. it's a lot of fun. And so that's what I've done as my hobby forever. So that actually, that skill really paid off because when you're, you're flying in an eight foot by eight foot by 10 foot long room with obstacles in it out of sight, you know, the drone is down below underground and you can't physically see it. You're relying a hundred percent on that video link and, and the drone wants to wander around in that space because of the complex airflow that it's, it's the drone itself is generating. Yeah, It requires kind of a, a unique set of skills uh, to pilot in that space. I would and imagine. I loved it. It was you, it was a lot of fun. Do you have signal attenuation issues when you're in a spot like that? Because if it's concrete and you're underground, I would think like RF starts to get attenuated or I guess uh, messed up for people listening that don't know what attenuated means, like blocked. Yeah. So ironically, most of the drones, the video links that we see today are running a combo of 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz. And they rely mainly on the 5.8 gigahertz band to send the signal. And the higher the frequency, the better it can bounce off of hard objects like concrete. Huh. So in this in this space, if you're directly above the hole, the signals will bounce around under there and eventually make their way out and, and you will get a decent signal. Now, if you were to fly, you know, hundreds of feet down that, you know, maybe there's a corridor or something, you might start getting some some signal degradation and you might start seeing, you know, maybe your screen gets blurrier as the system auto lowers the bit rate to, to try to compensate, but it does really well. Even um, even some of these vaults were nine feet deep. The chimney, it's called the the vertical component before you enter the room. Yeah, it was nine feet before I got into the room, and I still had a rock solid video signal. That's pretty cool. Well, it's amazing you can do that at five point eight too, because I didn't realize the bouncing thing. I'd always thought of it like you know, the higher your frequency, the less likely it is to permeate you know, like dirt and layers of stuff and water. Like I think the RC what the submarine guys use like 16 kilohertz cause it's a lower frequency and it does better with water. Right. And so that's interesting. I, I didn't, I never really thought about it that way, but it makes sense to me. I mean, I, uh, not being an RF guy, but like trusting, you know, <laughs> that's cool. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it's a very powerful capability. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. The radio has multiple antennas on it. So it's actually receiving the signal at, at different points on the, on their RC con- receiver that the signal's coming in and it rebuilds it. So it actually takes advantage of some of those, uh, they call them multi-pathing. And that's where the signal coming out of the drone takes multiple paths to receive you before it actually comes to you. It bounces off of this wall and that wall, and then it hits the receiver. And then another burst of signal comes out and bounces off a different path and receives at the signal. So it uses multiple antennas to rebuild the image and takes advantage of that. Actually. That's pretty cool. It's called MIMO. It stands for multiple in, multiple out. Very, uh, very powerful system for dealing with multipathing and, and complex uh, occluded environments. That's really neat. Yeah, I, you know, it's, text keeps getting more and more advanced, and uh, that's one thing I don't know a whole lot about. So I have heard of MIMO or uh, MIMO, um, and then I've, I've heard of multipathing, but it, I appreciate you giving me the explanation because I don't know a whole lot about it. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I'm still learning a ton. I mean, it's I barely know much at all. It's uh, but I love RF and I'm always working with it. You know, it's you a do, lot of fun. But do you do any of the ham radio stuff? Like, I feel like the ham guys tend to be really, really good with RF. I don't know if that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah, the, yeah. The ham radio world is. I've always I was always more interested in in controlling a vehicle and getting live video. So I didn't yeah. get into just simple audio over great distances like the ham guys. That makes sense. But I have built a lot of my own antennas at home and, and use spectrum analyzers to tune them and so on. Oh, that's cool. Uh, which is what AM guys do. So you're just doing similar stuff, but applying it to a different field. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, it's I, a lot of fun. It's, I, it's I, amazing. Too, yeah. I too, I'm more interested in teleoperating vehicles than sending audio. So. Yeah. Uh, but less in the weeds on the spectrum analyzer side. I, I, there are very smart people I work with that are smarter than me that know how to do that stuff, but I I am not one of those guys. 
<laughs> it's a uh, that stuff can get really deep. I ended up I always end up asking for help. I I I think I get over my head really fast, but it's stuff I'm really interested in and and I'm I'm always looking uh, at the at the end result, like how fast can I get this thing in the field and actually test how it performs. And so, yeah, then I just dive into the minds and brains of those that are really really actual smart RF guys and and they point me in the right direction or tell me you're you're way off track here, you know, like <laughs> this is going to work and so it's good, you know, it's it's a uh, endless learning. Yeah, it's that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, one of my mentors said to me one time something I really liked, which is uh, I I was working on a high temp 3D printer trying to um, create you know a environment that could work at 100 centigrade and and still have functional electronics for printing polycarbonate. And um, I I made some rookie mistake. I can't remember what I perceived to be a rookie mistake. I can't remember what it was, and I was really feeling down on myself and you know, I'm just like, ah, I screwed up, I'm amateur. I thought this would take less time than it did. You know, and he goes, Spence, the day I quit learning is the day I quit R and D. Like, you know, yeah, <laughs> we, we all do that, you know, no worries. So maybe yep. feel a little better about it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good that's, mentor. That's, yeah, that's true. Maybe. Like I remember actually learning when I first got into engineering that I didn't realize electrical engineers will design a board and send it out and then it comes back and they will find all kinds of errors and they'll tweak it as much as it can send it out get a couple more built come back find more error this is an iterative process yeah and i in my head i guess they just thought they nailed it the first time which now looking back that was highly ignorant but I, i'm told yeah, some amazing. of them can um a lot of the ones i know say like three iterations is pretty typical like yeah I, yeah i don't know probably just depends, depends what you're depends doing the- i mean i think even like certain aerospace companies that we've all heard of, I'm told use like, you know, botch wires, like oftentimes, you know, that they'll fly because, you know, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah. Yep. I think, you know, yeah. Experience of the electrical engineer and then the complexity of the board. If it's just a three layer board that has some low speed, simple power supplies or something on there, they're going to nail it. But if it's a 16 layer board with high speed to interconnects and, you know, you got this a wide variety of signals on board. It's it's gonna it's gonna take multiple iterations. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, cool. Yep. So, what are some of the other like I don't know, just interesting inspection missions you've run, or like, what's the weirdest thing you found on an inspection mission? Like, was there ever anything where you're like, I cannot connect collect enough data with this drone? Like, we need other sensors or like just people on the ground or like. You know what the hell am I looking at? You know, did like what's what's some crazy shit you've seen, Phil? So, when you look at the the conductors overhead, the actual wires that carry power, they can't be like five miles long of single continuous wire. They may be a mile, and then they because the spools would be way too huge to carry them, and so they come up to a pole that has insulators on it, and then they tie to those insulators, and the circuit has to continue on, and it's it's dead ended at that pole, right? So they have a, a interconnect called a dead end, and that actually brings the power from that conductor coming in and then routes it around the pole to the other conductor on the other side and continues it on. So you have this short section of wire that uses these these splice tools or this uh, splice assembly called an intercon- or a dead end. And so those dead ends um, are a failure point because they're, you know, anywhere you're joining two wires together, it's basically a splice. And now you have the opportunity for, for failure. So... I did thermal inspections on those all over Delaware. And some of those, there was one in particular that the bolts that connect it, the actual plates together were all melted and, and corroded looking. And I'm staring at it and I'm flying, I'm, I'm hovering eight feet away and I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, it doesn't look like it's melted, but it, but it looks like it's melted. So it's just not making sense in my head. And I just don't understand how this, this, these bolts are like, gone or or there's like pitting and you know it's like looks like it got hit by a laser beam or something you know one of the where the bolts was and the other ones are all sagging down like they got overheated but they're they're also kind of chewed away and so ended up going back to the office and talking to to some experienced electrical engineers in the utility industry and they looked at it and they said oh that's corona so very very high voltage discharge or not discharge but field that builds up around this can actually start etching into this and so that was very eye-opening ah. i had no idea Wait, can, uh, i was used to seeing you know overheated metal which is a very distinct you know runny pattern the, the metal looks very uh you know 
smooth and, and melty as you would yeah. expect. And this didn't really match that. So it was, it was very eye-opening. And, and that so was, I wish they had better sensors. With Corona, there's pitting. And it's yeah. a result of just like field discharge radiating, if I'm understanding, or am I? Yeah, I, I don't know enough about Corona and how it actually damages the the material to know really how to describe it. It's no I know it's, a, it's an unusually high you know field strength. Like if you look at if you look at like a conductor that carries power, there are actually many little strands. And if somebody, maybe a hunter, you know, missed he's shooting at a bird and hit the line. <laughs> or maybe shot it on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> can happen. people get bored. Uh, it, it will tear a hole through it, and some of those conductors will those little actual strands of wire will stick up in the air, and they're, they'll actually function like little antennas for a corona. Huh. And it'll build up a corona field around that. Anywhere there's a you know this long, basically anything that can be like an antenna at the tip, it'll build up this big field, and that can cause a lot of havoc with uh, RF because it's just uh, if you look at it with a spectrum like analyzer, a spark it's gap generator. Wide, spewing noise you know it's just yeah. crazy how much energy it can generate yeah we've we've got a demo in this office where we have um ground vehicles um that i call drones but it's a little uh differential drive track vehicle with a camera on it and we had a competition uh during coronavirus different other corona uh, when <laughs> that was you know like you know nobody, nobody wanted to leave their house because everybody was worried about getting sick and so we created this demo. People could drive our robots over the internet. And um, we, one of the events we were sponsoring that we wanted people to run the demo for was the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Inspection and Maintenance Robots Summit. And so we got an out of work Broadway set designer because Broadway fired everyone. And she designed this um, mock industrial disaster. So I'm actually looking at it now. It's got a, um, a busted up um, cable chase and there's wires hanging down is one of the dangers to human life that we we created for this that the robot's supposed to be able to spot when you're running this inspection mission and um i wanted to have like it's not really realistic but i thought it would be cool to have like sparking wires like at the end of um you know one of these cables hanging down so took um just regular flexible metal conduit with wires in it just from some scraps i had from work i was doing and um i took a uh, like two kilovolt power supply and I uh, energized two of the conductors and then had a puddle on the ground. I was thinking, oh, this will look really cool, but it jammed our Wi-Fi, <laughs> so we couldn't yeah. run the robots. <laughs> so we had to we had to de-energize that. So. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much noise uh, something like that will uh, RF noise that will generate across a pretty wide spectrum, uh, depending on well, yeah, there's a lot of factors, but yeah, it's it can really mess a lot of uh, communications equipment up. I'm surprised you're still able to fly the drone if, if it was, you know, like that, uh, that bad and ongoing. Like that's, that's pretty cool. Did you notice signal degradation when you were doing that or was it? They, like yeah, this, um, I think this particular circuit had been overloaded for a while. And then uh, that one, you know, there's three phases to a circuit. And I think that it was only on one phase. So something had happened where one phase got way too much current, which they're supposed to be balanced. It's very yeah. important. So I think something had failed for a while and caused this. You know, maybe it was not. It might have been happening over years. And then by the time I flew along, I think had, uh, they had already stabilized that and, and balanced it out. So it wasn't doing that anymore. Uh, but it had been very compromised. So, you know, definitely something they wanted to get up and fix within the next 24 hours. It all you know at that point you're missing a couple of the bolts that that are holding it together and the other two are of uh unknown um integrity anymore yeah so it's it's bad is what you're saying <laughs> yes it's bad the utility industry everything that they do is is centered around making sure there's never an outage they they yeah. get that's their core metric is how many outages do they have per year and how long are they so you know flying commercial drones for the utilities Really, what I was doing was helping them for, or detect issues before they became an outage. And that was why thermal cameras were so were so powerful, because you can see something overheating, uh, starting to get too hot past what it should before it ever actually goes into thermal runaway, which is which is a fancy way of saying boom. Yeah. Uh, and and now, you know, the utility has time to send a crew out there and actually repair it without ever there being an outage. Or maybe they have to take an outage, but it's planned and it's and it's it's minimized and it's very quick you know so it's very powerful capability 
using you know drones to get up there and actually see issues early. That's awesome. What are the, I guess, what do you see getting hot when you're doing these inspections? Like, are you, is it like sections of cable? Is it, um, you know, just like insulators or where insulators are supposed to be, but maybe like you're sort of starting to conduct or like what, maybe a thing across like the thing that's getting energized. Like if you've got one of those branches, like what, what are those objects that you detect that on? Like, where do you tend to see like increased thermals? So yeah, with, with electrical, the conductors themselves, unless they're deeply compromised, like eroded down to where it's very tiny, there are usually never any heat on the wire itself. There sh- and there shouldn't, if there is, I mean, it, you, you're probably, <laughs> I mean, minutes away from failure, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you've got major problems, but what you'll see is dead ends, you know, like I said, where, there is a splice or anywhere or an actual splice, you know, which can be along any long, you know, along a strain, a length of conductor, you might have a splice if, if it was damaged by a tree falling on it and it broke and they rejoined it. So anywhere you have those connections. So of course, electrical substations have a lot of connections because you have fuses and you have uh, switches and you have all this, these points where electricity is moving from one point to another. And so those were, are definitely where you'll start seeing overheating issues that and makes catch sense. it early. So anywhere where like two cables connect through a thing, the thing might overheat or the, the splice might overheat. Is yep. where you yeah, so even it. like a transformer mounted on a pole uh, where you have your three wires coming down and those lugs where it connects to it, you, you look at all three of them in the thermal camera and two of them are 10 degrees above ambient, which is good. That's normal. And then the third one is 120 degrees above ambient. It's like, oh, <laughs> that is probably either it's an unbalanced phase for some reason, or it's a 99% of the time it's not that. That's really it's pretty unusual. But what what it is 99% of the time is the metal has, from wind and vibration and, and, and energy movement, it's actually relaxed. This, they use soft metals, you know, for electrical, you have uh, aluminum and and uh other you know other soft metals and so Copper. you don't have this natural like spring tension holding it so over time it loosens over you know could be years and then it doesn't have a good physical contact and that causes high electrical huh. resistance which causes heat that's really interesting so it's like a bolt comes loose and the thing's just kind of resting and as a result and maybe there's like some corrosion between the contacts and as a result that's how you get that sort of thing exactly yep it makes a lot of sense I heard that like Belfield washers were pretty revolutionary to, to mitigating that sort of thing just by keeping tension on, on like screw terminals. But I don't know to what extent you've, you've kind of seen that be in the case or not. Yeah. It's funny when you're focused on inspections, you're only ever looking at and looking for defects. So you don't really pay attention to the thing that they're working and how they're built. (laughs) It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of ironic. Like you, you realize later, like it took me a while, but I realized I was missing out on a lot of good information to be gleaned from things that didn't fail. And, and we're clearly out there for 50 years. Some of this equipment has been on the pole for 50 years without being maintained and still working, you know, just as good as the day it was put in. And it's like, that's fantastic. That's, that's amazing engineering. Yeah, for sure. The way they work, if you're interested, uh, just because I'll just explain to you the way the guy explained to me, is it's like a conical washer. So it's like a cone with the tip of the cone chopped off. And I guess there's like some difficult math to get in the geometry right. But basically it exerts a common, a constant force, like no matter how far you compress it. And so if you put one between a terminal and like the screw, it can kind of keep the force constant and make it less likely to, you know, suffer from ex- thermal expansion and contraction on the bolt. So I don't know. That's kind of that sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah. That kind of reminds me of the concept of like a spring steel lock washer, you know, uh, but this, this is more of a cone. Full, what was, what was it called? A Belfield washer. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. yeah it's, it's cool. Cool engineering nerd stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how much goes into just a washer. Like it's, oh, for it's crazy sure. how much you do design and thought and testing. Uh, but then when it's nailed, it, it goes out there and it's, you know, be, it starts getting used in huge range of industries and really helps. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. They use them a lot on ball valves too. Like you, you see them, uh, cause like, I guess to hold either side of the ball, but yeah. So 
I guess I'd be interested to hear about, uh, you, you told me a cool story about thermal cameras last time we talked and just some of the different technologies you've seen. And, and it was stuff I didn't know about because I've never gotten that deep. And like I have, I have a $400 FLIR, you know, thermal imager that's handheld, but that's not what you were talking about. So I guess, can, yeah. you, can you tell me a little bit about that? And, you know, maybe we can kind of get in the weeds there a little. Yeah, thermal cameras are are really awesome. They they don't view the world uh, the way our eyes work and, and regular cameras work. They are only seeing the world in, in radiated heat, and so they they're actually uh, there's a wide range of them, but they're they're kind of classified by the wavelength that they're that they're designed to look look for. So they're short wavelength and medium wavelength and long wavelength, and so it's all capital S W I R. So they are pronounced a squeer or M W R, you know, I R as well. They, I guess they don't say muir, but <laughs> or be leer uh, for long. Yeah, uh, long but they, infrared, you know, long wave. Yep, yeah. long wave infrared. W L or L W L I R. Yeah. Um, but weir, leer, swear. I think I'm. Yeah, it's, swear is the only one that gets pronounced. I think, but yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, oh yeah, makes sense. The, but we uh, we commonly use at least in the drone industry a long wave infrared and that is also what you'll see in scopes for hunters and, and handheld inspection tools like you just mentioned those are almost always long wave and that's um for multiple reasons and one of them is cost the sensor itself doesn't need to be cooled the actual focal plane the of the sensor it doesn't have to be cooled down in order to work it can it can just work and detect infrared waves uh, at ambient temperature but a medium wave sensor they actually use a little, often a little helium pump and ah. cool that focal plane sensor down to below 200 degrees Fahrenheit and, Wild. Or, or even colder. And what that does is it allows it to see, like, like I said, in that medium wavelength spectrum. And it also makes it extremely sensitive so it can see very, very minute amounts of heat. So one of the coolest things was working at that drone company. We had a long wave infrared sensor attached to a laptop, you know, live, live video on the laptop dis displayed from it. And then next to it, we had another laptop with a medium wave infrared cooled sensor. So it had a little pump running and, and it was, you know, sitting there and they're both looking across the lab at, a, at the other side of the, of the uh, engineering lab. And we had, we had this tour group come through a bunch of executives and we said, hey, you want to see the difference between a $7,000 camera and a $70,000 camera? <laughs> and that was roughly what the prices were, you know, so that, that cooled sensor was 10 times the cost, but. We walked over and we just held her hand flat against the drywall in front of these cameras for 20 seconds. And when we pulled her hand away, you can see the handprint on the wall. It's called a heat scar. So you can actually see the, the full heat that's been imparted from your hand into the drywall on those two laptop screens. Interesting. But as you're watching the screen from the long wave, you can actually see the heat leaving. You can see that the handprint kind of fading away as you're, as you're watching, like in real time. And so within a minute, it's, it's pretty much undetectable. But the medium wave inf infrared, the, the executives continued their tour, and 10 minutes later, they came back, and you could still see the handprint. <laughs> it's very, very faint, but you could totally make it out. The tiniest amount of heat still retained in that wall, and that sensor was detecting it. That's awesome. It's just amazing what can be done with it. Yeah, there's, I, I kind of wonder. There have got to be all kinds of uses that you wouldn't even think about for that kind of stuff until you experience it. and start to mess around with it. Like what are, what are some of the things people use those medium wave and do the short wave, are they even more sensitive or is that just kind of like just different use, but like, yeah. Yeah. They have their pros and cons for, for applications. Uh, short wave is actually one of the coolest things it can do is can essentially see through some, some fog and smoke and dust. So uh, out in hood river, we, we had, there was actually a picture of, from a boat with a short wave infrared this camera is facing down the Columbia river towards the, the actual toll bridge that goes between white salmon and hood river. And it was a very foggy day and, and you couldn't see the bridge. Like maybe you could kind of tell for a daylight camera. And then they switched to the shortwave infrared and you could see the entire bridge and you could see cars <laughs> on it and everything. There's a slight haze across the image, you know, still, but in a daylight image, you could, you couldn't even hardly really tell there's a bridge there at all. But, you know, just regular cameras right side by side, you know, with the short wave. So That's cool. they have their, their value, their, their use cases. Um, and, and it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's used in uh, agriculture for detecting uh, crop health and so on. So there's a lot, 
there's huh. a lot to be done with detecting, you know, how, whether plants or things have been damaged. How does crop health correlate to um, like infrared radiation? Like, how do you, what does that look like if you're, if you're looking through one of those imagers at, at like, I don't know, plants of some kind? Yeah. So every everything has uh, will reflect heat, and so a short wave camera can look at a plant, and if it has been damaged, those areas have a dis different emitted radiation signature. So the par the parts of the plant that are healthy are very different in appearance to an infrared camera than the parts that have been physically you know hurt by either too much pesticides or too much fertilizer or actual pests themselves chewing on the plant. And so you can tune the camera to make those areas pop and it can kind of ignore everything else. So you can really, at a glance, you can tell where there's damage on the, on the farmer's field. That's pretty awesome. How much do those sensors cost approximately? What's the entry point for those? I have not tangled with those much. Uh, no it's uh, agriculture side. I've not really looked into too much. Um, I know they use multiple cameras altogether. They call them hy hyperspectral. And so that's basically saying we're going to take three or more cameras that are very narrow tuned for specific wavelength of energy and we're going to we're going to build an image out of those three together and we're going to you know tune it for specific types of plants so i know the the cool thing is the output from those is like if you have it flying over a particular field all of the plants that you want to see will be dull brown and then anything else that's growing out there will pop as bright red or some other color so oh that's interesting at, at one glance you can tell okay we have pet, we have weeds growing right here and right here you know they uh, they the whole entire field is uniform brown except for the areas that have something that's not what you're looking for and then it highlights those uh, you know in a totally different color that's really really interesting cuz i know you hear a lot about in the robotics field and i've not really worked in the space very much um, or really at all uh, but precision agriculture seems to be a buzzword now. And I guess that's got to be a big part of it, you know, just kind of hearing about this again, you know, not not an expert on precision ag yet. But um, it's, uh, yeah. it's interesting to know that there's that sensing modality that would probably be useful there. Yeah, that's definitely a key part of precision agriculture is drones, you know, whether they're multi-rotor or fixed wing, flying over fields with those hyperspectral cameras, which are shortwave infrared and and daylight cameras there there's a combo uh you know used to look for crop health and that's a key part of precision agriculture because any image it takes will be geotagged or have the actual coordinates of well, where that image was the shortwave part almost sounds like cheating i mean like you know <laughs> just i always assume when people talk about imaging they they just had meant uh rgb imaging and you know i wasn't realizing that you know they could actually highlight degraded parts of plants or plants that were slightly different I don't know if color is the right word for this, but, you know, different types of plants. Um, yeah. So that's that's pretty neat to know about. Yeah, they do species identification with them. You know, it's, you know, because the, a particular type of tree will have its own thermal radiation pattern compared to others. So you can tune the, those wavelengths of those cameras to only look for that and ignore everything else. And so you can fly over an area and, you know, this is especially important to utilities because, there's a variety of trees that are being attacked by invasive species, and these trees are a fall threat. So if, if they detect them within so many feet of a transmission line, they know they have to send somebody out there and cut them out, get them out of there. That makes sense. Just because they know there's this invasive beetles that are taking on these trees and making them fall all the time. So they have to try to find those particular species of trees all along a, a transmission line right of way and, and find it quickly and, and then send a crew out. So it's... It was useful for, uh, yeah, definitely precision agriculture and also other other uh, sensing applications. But, yep. Yeah, it's badass. What do you use the uh, the medium range uh, stuff for? Uh, so maybe medium range, medium wavelength stuff. Yeah. For. Yep. Medium wave infrared is is commonly used for search and rescue um, and any any type of uh, ISR. Which, uh, yes, which means intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Got it. So you see a lot of uh, smaller, um, you know, un uh, fixed wing drones being used overseas and in combat zones, and they're actually detecting, you know, they're not armed or anything, but they're just keeping overwatch and looking for any, any threats. So they, because those are the ones that have that extreme sensitivity, they're very good at detecting people against uh, a wide variety of environments. So it's so whether like a it's snow sniper, for sand. instance, would be pretty hard to camouflage against something like that. 
Yeah, yes, yeah, very hard to camouflage. You can actually detect uh, even things that get planted, maybe an IED ex improvised explosive device or along a roadway, you know, some, somebody put it out there inside of a car and they're waiting for troops to pass and they're going to remotely detonate it. If you fly ahead of the crew uh, before the troops go, you can actually see where the ground has been disturbed because huh. there's a different heat signature of it. It's because someone and, touched it recently, like that handprint you were talking about. Yep. Yep, That's for sure, especially the ground because it you know had a lot of thermal mass. So if you dig a big old trench to oh 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 do this, so it might even be colder than ambient because you've brought up cold dirt and there's like sun beating down, and so yeah, just a whole just to change some delta, yeah, definitely, yeah. And then medium wave um, is also used on drones now a little bit. It's so expensive that it doesn't. It's not being used much in drones, but there's some people foraging into it, and what they're doing is. They can actually detect methane gas leaks and other other gas. What's so called an optical gas sensor. Huh. Clear actually has some really cool Did optical gas sensors. So yeah, you can actually see leaks that are otherwise are invisible to the human eye with you, this camera. Are you detecting just deltas and temperature, or are you actually doing like chemical sensing on on a, a visual like not a visual on an image? I actually, I'm not 100% sure. I believe there are ones that do have a ability to detect certain chemicals. That and I think makes sense. they're tuned. Yeah. Well, there's a company in Pittsburgh. They, I don't know for sure. I, I heard a rumor they might be closed, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but it's called ChemImage, and I know they were working on a sensor like that that could image uh, for chemicals. And so I, I wonder if either FLIR acquired some of their tech or if they just developed independently or what. I mean, that's that's super cool. And then Teledyne yeah, is very... FLIR now, right? So that's, that's yeah, it's yeah, that's interesting. It's... <laughs> yep, bringing it. Yeah, it's a lot of companies uh, seem like a, quite a few are purchasing each other lately. But yeah, yeah definitely sure. FLIR still is the big name in, in uh, infrared sensors, whether they're short wave or medium wave or long wave. There was some weird sensor. You might have even been the one that told me about it from FLIR. That was like, was it an acoustic camera? Did you did you tell me about that? Yeah, yep. That's really cool. Uh, it's very important for utility industry. So that's what it's targeted at explicitly. So we were talking about Corona earlier. Well, Corona is actually makes enough noise, uh, higher voltages that human ears can hear it. So there's the radiated uh, RF noise, and then there's also audible noise. And so... What you can do with this camera is is walk along, you know, holding it in your hands. It's very small, compact. It's and you can aim it up at these utility poles, and and you can kind of basically scan. It's got a narrow kind of field of view, and you can scan up and down the insulators and other points on the pole. And anywhere there's like a lot of noise being radiated, physical noise, it'll it'll like bloom on the image. It'll it'll kind of cover or colorize where that's occurring, and then you can snap a picture and, and you can give it as to the utility to say, hey, this pole. At the upper left corner by the A phase has a uh, corona issue. So it's really powerful. That's awesome. And I think the way that works from looking at FLIR's website, if I remember right, is there was a little RGB camera in the middle, and then there were either a bunch of mic, there's probably a microphone array, and it's doing some sort of like, I would assume like trilateration on the sound, but I, I might be wrong on that. I don't know how they're figuring out where the sound's coming from. But it, it seems like they got an array of mics and then they're corroborating that to an RGB image or superimposing that over an RGB image. And, and that's how they're doing that it, it, approximately. Yeah, I think the magic there is in the signal processing, you know, really tightly understanding the, the reference between multiple points of microphones and what you're looking at against uh, the background noise and really, you know, triangulating it or, or basically co-locate or, you know, not co-locating it, but actually truly understanding where it is and 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 quantifying it. Also, that's the other part too. You don't, you don't want to false positives like this is bad, and then the utility goes out there and there's nothing wrong. <laughs> so there's kind of a tricky tricky uh, problem to solve. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, at a certain point, you know, people are going to stop buying Flares products if they release something that does that. Yeah, they they definitely nailed it with this. There's a lot of utilities using it uh, in different ways and. Can you do other fun stuff with that besides just looking for Corona? Like, can you tell which person's talking in like a group of people if you uh, if you pointed at like a crowd and, and people are like making noise or like? I kind of wonder like if there's like an insect and you point it like, can you kind of like tell if it's like you know 
what sort of noise have you messed around with these at all i haven't messed with them um but the thought is that right away my thought is that they would not it's very unlikely that they that they have made it that wide of the band of noise it listens for it's probably very very tuned because they needed to get the the performance that they were looking for so they had to yeah, you're probably you know, they would have had to hone this down yeah that yeah, makes a lot of sense i feel like it'd still be fun to play with one of those but i think they're they're quite expensive just to get it for a hobby if i yeah. remember correctly <laughs> so, i can't imagine they sell a ton or at least you know i can't imagine they sell very many outside the utility industry based on what you're saying yeah yep yeah. definitely specific cool what are some of the other like just maybe non-camera non-lidar just sensors i might not have seen before that you've you've worked with or you've seen so there's there's a a lot of energy and money being poured into sensors to detect the world around you whether that's a medium wave infrared or it's lidar that's very compact and low cost um, lidar stands for uh, light detection and ranging and and radar of course is a very big and powerful feature or a very very powerful technology but if you look at like radar units they typically were maybe the smallest one was the size of a, of a car and the prices was in the millions and it just they were not something that businesses would ever use it was military and and now there's radar units that are the size of a box a shoe box and there's or even smaller. one just got smaller um just got announced uh so, you know, there's a lot of use case for that. It's about the size of an iPhone, this ra small radar unit, oh, solid awesome. state, and and much lower cost. So, so they're going to use it. Electronically scanned, I'm guessing, too. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Exactly. Yep. So those sensors, uh, I haven't tangled with them a ton yet, but I've been uh, talking to multiple companies about how we, we integrate them into drones and along the drone's path also, mounting them on top of towers, utility towers. So that way, ever so often along the path, you have this situational awareness of the airspace that is communicating back to the drone and the drone itself has sensors on it so it can see the world around it more than just the visual camera and relying on the pilot. That's now awesome. the drone will have the ability to detect and avoid oncoming birds or aircraft or other drones or anything. And that's the future. It's coming. Uh, and it's, yeah. yeah, it's really exciting stuff. I, I agree. Radar is a neat one to kind of see coming onto the scene. I first, sort of tangled a little bit with radar in 2014, um, maybe it was 2015, somewhere in there when I, I worked for Joy Global, we were looking at um, automotive radar for mining vehicles. And it, it was, I think it was, that's when it was like first coming out. And so there was like a Delphi unit that was kind of hot around then that like bragged about having electronically steered radar. And it was, it was similar size to what you're describing, like maybe like a six inch square by like maybe two or three inches deep. Like it was, it was pretty neat. And they bragged that you could mount it under a car bumper because like plastic apparently is transparent to it is, is what the manufacturer said. So it's kind of, kind of neat. So I, um, I, haven't, I haven't done a whole lot with those, but I, I kind of helped with like integration on those uh, at that, at that gig. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Cars have had radar on them, like you said, for quite a few years. Um, Duff was, uh, rolled them out, you know, quite a few years ago, and and many manufacturers integrated them for what we call hands-off cruise or or uh, adaptive cruise control, and so they built them right into the bumpers of cars. So that way, as the traffic starts to slow down in front of you, your car just autonomous, you know, automatically matches the speed, and it also is useful for emergency braking. So, a friend of mine actually, he's a he's a utility, he's a lineman, you know, he's cool. been in the utility industry for 15 years. Through, he, he went down to Georgia to take care of a big storm. You know, some massive storm happened and they were working 16 hour days. And, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were, they were down there just uh, working some crazy hours in the heat and humidity and repairing the lines. And then they were driving home and it was, I don't know, two in the morning and he fell asleep on the highway, got his cruise set at 80 miles an hour. Brutal. And up ahead, there was a traffic jam. Cars were at a dead stop and his F-150 or F-250 with adaptive cruise control, slammed on the brakes by itself and stopped. Saved oh, that's their life. awesome. Yeah, it actually, you know, detected the stop vehicles and it stopped the truck. It's awesome. It's super cool technology to me. Yeah, that, that is wild, and and I'm I'm really glad that exists. Like that's that's great. Yeah, it's amazing. That stuff. That's like a really cool application, but it's it's kind of uh, in the end, it's relatively simple as compared to mounting a radar on a drone and giving it like the ability to detect and track objects around it in space and their distance and, 
and speed and vector or heading and you know th which radar is really good for but that's much more complex to do that than say on a flat 2d surface on a road look only so far ahead and look for large objects that are you know in your narrow field of view because cars are really only traveling directly straight so, or drones you know move all over are the radar units that are being um sort of targeted toward drones then like different than the automotive grade radar is it like just a totally different sensor and it needs to be because of that like just the field of view is different yeah the field of view and it's um it's it's resolution and it's range so you know the the ones for cars you know the, obviously the farther out it can see the better but at some point there's a you're diminishing returns as far as advantage what you're what you're trying to do and so it's not as stringent of a requirement for its resolution and it's it's how how finely detail it can see because you're looking at you're looking for giant cars you know like you're not looking for you know rabbits or something small on the road and trying to deal with that you're just using it to adapt to you know other vehicles on the road and you're only looking you know so many hundreds of feet out but some type of drone moving along maybe 60 miles an hour in airspace if you wanted to you want the radar on board to actually detect wires and dodge it or stop or go around it or detect other drones or birds or other so you threats can detect and wires deal. with it yeah, you can actually see wires, and, like uh, conductors. Yeah, like yeah, that's, lines that's, in the sky. That's tricky to do. Like that's that's been incredibly difficult from a camera perspective. To like that's been like an ongoing problem with drones. That's that's interesting. That that's, that's yeah. The, the conductors themselves have uh, yeah, they're very tiny uh, and they they blend in with their environment. You know, they're <laughs> yeah, they're hard to see visually. Uh, they're seeing those conductors. You know, is actually a big problem. So. One of the other use cases that I'm excited about is even like flying in manned helicopters. You know, they, those guys fly, they do get into the power lines once in a while accidentally. Oh. You know, most of the time the pilots are careful and they really know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're probably the, the most uh, highly trained pilots, this, you know, helicopter pilots that do utility work or fly for emergency response. They, they're amazing, but even, even they ha have their hands, like they're, they're, when they're flying, they're so saturated. Their brain is trying to deal with so much data coming in at once. Yeah, it makes sense. That there's a threat that they could hit a pole or a, or a wire uh, for you know a transmission power. And so the idea to me is that you know maybe somebody we can someday we can integrate radar into these you know relatively low cost helicopters and give that much more awareness to the pilot in real time while he's flying and, and help avoid obstacles that otherwise a human might not see if maybe the maybe there's you know fog or something coming in which no pilot should be flying a heli in that but hey you know weather happens right so yeah yeah for sure now, that that makes a lot of sense i mean and if you could do something similar to like the FLIR acoustic camera and highlight the color you know or something just make it like starkly contrasting in a way where it's it's apparent i mean that would probably save lives yeah it'd be huge yeah yeah, there's there's definitely um, other sensors coming along. Like, there's a, actually a company in out near Pittsburgh that is making a really cool magnetic sensor for uh, detecting transmission lines and, and following them. So if you lose GPS with a drone and you're flying autonomously, where it's it's following a pre-programmed mission, if it loses GPS for some reason, you're 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 pretty much going to crash or lose the drone, in because there's no other way for it to navigate. Huh. And now they have developed this magnetic sensor that's underneath the drone and it actually tracks the transmission lines and it'll follow that back to you oh, without cool. GPS. Does it so, ever, is there a risk of it going the wrong direction? Like <laughs> just continuing to go away from you down the transmission line? Yeah, you could, uh, I suppose you could probably have it, uh, if it saw a GPS go away and was going to start relying on that, you could have the sensors on board that detect its motion uh, and its speed and so on, you know, stop it and then pivot and go the other way you know and if it is if you do command to rotate it would you would know that it spun 180 degrees by those accelerometers on board and gyros so if it did that and then reacquired the magnetic field okay it would so know you, have, you have an approximate dead reckoning of where you're at and so that's kind of how you avoid that you know polarity issue or whatever directional polarity yeah it, the wrong words that it, means a different it, thing yeah they definitely um they haven't really fully tested that kind of use case yet, but it's it's coming, and they they are flying over corridors and, and tracking that, and and they're able to you know basically keep the drone within a uh, almost like a 
geofenced area or a, or a magnetic field fenced area so it doesn't wander outside of that. It's another way to add redundancy and safety to drone operations for utility work. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it's just kind of cool to see these, you know, these new sensors. Like, I'm such a nerd for, for different types of sensors. And I mean, I, I, I love, you know, kind of figuring out, you know, how do you get a robot to perceive the stuff it needs to perceive? I actually wrote an article probably like five years ago now called Choosing the Best Sensors for Mobile Robots and enumerated like 30 different types of sensors and talked about how they worked and when you'd want to use them. And I was, I was really proud of it. I asked like a whole bunch of different subject matter experts and like, you know, got all these insights. And then uh, Google Drive just deleted it like a month into me oh. writing it. So I had to write the whole article again. <laughs> Ouch. It's published now, but yeah, it was it was a real pain in the rear to have to reauthor that thing. It was a good exercise in stoicism, right? Because you know, <laughs> easy to get mad, but you you know, what's that going to accomplish? <laughs> so I just have to rewrite it, yeah, or not. But I chose to. <laughs> you should send me a link to that. I would love it. I um, just I also Google choosing the best sensors for awesome. a mobile robot. It'll be the first thing that comes up. I'll send yeah. it to you if you mind me. Yeah, yeah, it's um. I recently, as you know, we talked, um, you know, was building out a, a concept of a robot that was going to inspect utility tunnels under a commercial airport. And, you know, if you're going to detect the environment around you, there's a lot of ways to do it visually or thermally or, you know, noise or, how, you know, there's all kinds of ways. But every sensor has its strengths and weaknesses. So, you know, you have to look at your environment and then take an engineering perspective and say, how do I, how do I deal with all these weaknesses and and address them so you need like multiple sensors you know a wide range of them and you got to oh, choose yeah. them carefully based on your environment and that's that's actually you know what's really wild is the sensors have gotten better and cheaper and smaller so yeah i think you know 10 years ago you might need to spend hundred thousand dollars and have 12 sensors and now you might be able to do it for five thousand with four sensors oh yeah you know or or two sensors and you know costs went down and capabilities went up and it's even started to cross into the others you know domain where normally you couldn't use one for the other yeah. application. Well, what's badass to me is seeing the the new technologies that are coming out of like the cell phone industry just because yeah. of the crazy economies of scale that like Apple and Google and Samsung and Motorola are able to get on these devices. And so you have this MEMS tech, like IMUs, for instance, like to see like yeah. those, those Bosch units for like, what is it, like seven, eight bucks for the chip? And they're they're not bad little chips, you know, like all the Intel real senses, I think, come with one of those in them. And then yep. you get like, um, what else? Like, I mean, those there's some pretty inexpensive thermal cameras. Like, I'm sure long range, uh, sorry, long wavelength from what you're saying. But um, you know, that's to me is is pretty interesting. And then, um, what else are you seeing coming out? Of that? I mean, the camera technology getting as cheap as it has. Like, you know, like what, like sub five dollars for a camera? Like, or like maybe yeah. it's more than that, but it's a really nice camera. And so um, that's that's been really fun to watch. Like the fact that you can get a DJI drone for like eight hundred bucks. That's got, I mean, I again your domain more than mine. But like it seems from the outside looking in, from some of these little pocket sized ones I've seen, that the amount of machine you get for like a grand, you know, is is like pretty wild, and it wouldn't be possible yeah. without those technological advancements. You know, it's they're using the cell phone tech. I feel like what's interesting to me is the Unitry robot dog. So. That thing is definitely using cell phone technology. It costs about a tenth as much as the Boston Dynamics Spot. And it's, um, it definitely, it'll, it'll just face plant sort of randomly. Like you can tell Boston Dynamics spent more money on their autonomy and they, and they got a lot more robust. Like when I've driven a spot, what'll happen is I actually, somebody let me drive one and I tried to see if I could crash it into like, Nothing, like, crazy, but, like, I just wanted to see if I could, like, bump against a person's leg, you know. Like, I didn't want to break it. I just was curious, you know, what it would and wouldn't let me do. And, mm -hmm. it, it, like, there's, like, a virtual bubble. Like, it won't let you, you know, like, the autonomy software is, like, pretty pretty clean. Um, and then with the Unitree robot dog, I haven't driven it yet, but I have a friend that, that was driving one around at a trade event recently who was telling me that you can um, – It'll just let you smash into stuff like at like full full sprint, and then uh, he was he was driving around and it just face planted and dragged across the floor. 
But I mean, still, like the fact that they've made a robot dog for what, like seven, eight grand, is pretty, pretty impressive. <laughs> so you couldn't do that without, you know, cell phone tech. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the economies of scale have, and and the requirements for miniaturization have have enabled other technologies, even multi rotors, like what we think, you know, a drone can be anything that flies with its own onboard computer. So a helicopter or a fixed wing, they could be drones. But many people, when you when they hear the word drone, they think of, you know, a quadcopter, four electric motors, and it hovers and it takes off and, you know, vertically and flies. You know, it doesn't look like any kind of aircraft. That exists because of cell phone technology. There, there wasn't enough processing power and sensors small enough to actually stabilize a platform like that with four motors and 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 fly you know until right, 20 years ago whatever it was when cell phones started really taking off and then engineers tinker engineers you know those that like to experiment took the technology out of the cell phone and actually bolted it to a carbon fiber plate and some motors and started doing some tuning with sensors and got the things to fly and it was a direct result of that those mi mi miniaturization and low cost sensors that oh, I, I enabled it i completely agree and there's a company I, I worked with a little bit um, maybe 10 years ago that was doing, uh, you know, like robot boats. And this would have been 10 years ago before, like, the tech was really properly adapted to robotics. And the way that they got their costs down as a startup was they were just taking actual cell phones and sticking them on their robots to use this, like, a, a you know, central processing, you know, the robot computer or whatever you want to call it. Like, they were, they were using it for compute. So that, I thought that was kind of cool. I, I attempted to do it with uh, some cell phones at one point, just on a on a personal project. But I think they kind of locked down. It was the Pixel Two XL, and they, it seemed like they locked it down, so you couldn't really get good control over it at that point for whatever reason. Yeah, it's um, it's something I've thought about. Is you know, it'd be amazing if if uh, some manufacturer of cell phones decided to make one that was more had a lot more IOs and you know inputs and outputs and was was very robust. Because a cell phone, if you look at it, it's a processing unit, it's a Wi-Fi connection, it's got a camera, it's got onboard storage, it's got IMU. MEMS, gyros, yep. it's got, yeah, IMU in it in, in a long, long battery life. It's a phenomenal, you know, central brain or, you know, unit for a robot. But unfortunately, they've only been optimized for humans to hold and use. And, but with a few slight tweaks, you could just drop it into, you know, if you imagine the Unitree robotic dog, and you were able to just drop a, a cell phone right into its back, and now you have a cellular connection to the world. You've got you know, good Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, amazing camera, you know, all kinds of processing power. While they have graphic cards in them now, for all. Are you serious? You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, they have have like specialized graphic cards built into That's cell awesome. phones now. Like, well, they can do they do like three D gaming now, right? Like, I, I mean, I'm not yeah. a gamer, so I haven't been like tracking that tech. But I mean, I I, I hear things, you know, <laughs> so it seems like. I, I, I was the problem is I was like really addicted to like Starcraft and World of Warcraft when I was like uh, in undergraduate and so I just kind of cut myself off because I couldn't I couldn't handle it <laughs> so that's why I don't do that anymore. But it yep. is it is wild that they have the technological capability to do that like that is that is so cool. Yeah, it's amazing. The one of the things that got me fired up about sensors was cameras themselves rgb cameras like your what you would say your daylight camera or what you would use for point and shoots and inside of cell phones there's really two types of sensors there's cmos and ccd and this this refers to the actual material or the way the sensor itself that you know gathers incoming light is constructed and how it behaves but there's another sensor that i only learned about in the last year and a half and it's it's all capital spad it's called a spad sensor Interesting. And it stands for single photon avalanche diode. Huh. And so it is the coolest thing. I, I just got super excited about it. Canon is making a really cool SPAD sensor, and they're actually going to roll it out next year in their in their uh, security cameras first. And it's a 3.2 megapixel sensor, which doesn't sound amazing, but when you look at how this thing works, it's going to be very amazing. So it's actually counting individual photons. It's building them into every single every single pixel is like a well huh. of photons coming in huh. once it builds enough of them up it causes an avalanche which is why it's called a single photon avalanche diode and it's once it has enough of them in there it, it sends a pulse and, and that's that pixels you know so firing it's, basically it's a variable frame rate as a result of when those avalanches occur so it's extremely high frame rate if you want it you know hundreds of thousands of frames per second and oh, because you're counting photons you can essentially eliminate noise so this sensor can see in the dark like really good 
And does the frame rate go down in the dark though? I would assume, like it must. It's the way uh, you're describing it. Yeah, I think it must. I think there is limitations. So I haven't tangled with one yet because like yeah. they're not. Well, even I mean, if you got hundreds of thousands out. of frames a second, I can imagine the frame rate in the dark wouldn't be that bad. Yeah, it's it's, it's going to be yeah really good. And just looking at the images and reading about it on Canon's website is is enough to get me excited because it's such a uh, precise way to build an image. You know, you are actually individually counting photons and. It makes me think also that if you have that much timing control and you had multiple, and this is me just totally brainstorming, I could be way off here, but I thought about if you have, if you have multiple sensors, maybe three or, or more, and, or maybe you even have like multiples of three, you have, you know, you have three of them all in one plane and then another foot in front of it, you have another three and then another foot, you have another three. And, and now you have this physical separation between them and you are actually linking them with a high speed bus. Could you build a very accurate 3D image because you are, you know, looking at the same data coming in at multiple points in time, and now you understand depth, and that's why you'd have three. So, I, I'm not planned in this enough. I'm probably way, you know, diving into, you know, outside of my my area of expertise. But I, I, I can't help but get excited and think like if we if we're able to time that precisely, then yeah. we should be able to do more than just build an image. Yeah. Well, and. But we could already do that, though, with, with conventional cameras, I thought, right? Like, we, we use feature detection. So it's a little different than what you're describing. It's not – but I feel like it's kind of similar, too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. unless I'm misunderstanding the configuration. Yeah, regular – you could take, like, even just multiple cam uh, one multiple images at different points and then build them, you know, build a 3D model. Yeah, you know, which is what drones do often like, with like um, sensors, photogrammetry, like the real sense or, or the Z cam. Yeah, like the, there's off the shelf binocular, you know, sensors that that send out a point cloud now. Yep. Yeah, they're they're uh, very powerful, but there's there's a lot of artifacts that are introduced in the image because you're trying taking you're inferring and blending data. That's true. And so you see like the, these kind of uh, you know blurry images or or strange artifacts on the image if you try to build a 3d model uh from just a, a stereoscopic you know two two camera sensor like the real sense but if you had multiples of these at different points and you were you know super precisely timing maybe you could actually get more accurate you know modeling huh but it's yeah it's just a thought yeah, yeah. that would that'd be interesting it'd be, be really cool to see that work yeah i'm kind of excited about that for for use in, in drones because I obviously fly, you know, in confined spaces. Uh, I've done some sewer inspections with a drone also down flying in the big sewer tunnel uh, underground, you Dude, know. The so fact that you haven't lost signal on these underground missions is mind boggling to me. Like that is, <laughs> that is so cool. But yeah. I would, be, I would be terrified that I would lose signal and it would just crash in the water and I lose my drone. Yeah. You, uh, you definitely want to uh, have a contingency plan, whether it's really good insurance or <laughs> what you know. You're, yeah, you take a fifty thousand dollar drone and fly into uh, over uh, running water. And, How much you know, does it cost to insure ground. that? Like, it's got to be not cheap, I would think. Yeah, it depends on the insurance company and, and what you're doing with the drone, but commonly it's one tenth of the cost to replace it. So and that, you, you have know, to insure for the mission, and it's a tenth of the cost to replace it. Yeah, so I was insuring my drones for the month for oh, one okay. month. Um, so if you have a fifty thousand so, dollar drone, it's five k to short for the month, approximately. Yeah. Yep. Okay, that's interesting. And there's probably better deals out there. Maybe I'm overpaying, but that's that was the deal that I worked out. That seems pretty with. reasonable to me. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a high risk sort of thing for the insurance company as well. I would think so. That's that strikes me yeah. as you know about right. And I mean, I, I got into RC helicopters as a hobby for a little bit, and I suck as a pilot on those things. Like I'm, I'm terrible and I never got into the FPV ones. I always use the, uh, what the third person view or whatever you want to call it, like standing on the ground and looking up the thing. And, um, I, I crashed so many of them. I, I eventually, I just kind of cut myself off cause all of my RC helicopters were, were parts. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, um, you know, I just didn't, I didn't stick with it. But if you had me flying an inspection truck, <laughs> It should cost like at least as much as the drone to insure it, maybe half the price. So does does like pilot skill come into the the cost of insurance there? Like how do you how do you prove that to the insurance company? Just out of curiosity. Or that was is, is that not a thing? And I'm just yeah, they like they just don't give people like me insurance. 
Yeah. You would think it would play a role, but they don't, they don't actually ask. They don't really dive into uh, what your experience is and your background. I mean, if I was running an insurance company and somebody wanted to take a high risk adventure and, and I was going to insure them, I would want to do my due diligence and say, well, what is, what is my risk? You know, do you have that training in the background and the expertise to do this? Or are you a cowboy that's, you know, your odds are 90% that you're going to fail and I'm going to pay for it. And yeah, that's in this, in this context. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yep. that makes yeah. A lot helicopters, of sense. RC helicopters are very hard. I, I also experimented with them. I, I crashed a few, uh, repeatedly and then said, okay, I'm going to go back to, uh, you know, multi-rotors and, and so on. So multi-rotors, I'm not going to say they're easy, but they're not as challenging as helicopters. Yeah, they are, they're actually, they can be wildly easy depending on how you have them structured. So if it's a home built one, then you, it's basically going to be a radio controlled drone that, you know, you have to be very active on the sticks, but like DJI and other commercial drones, they, they're actually in, in stabilized mode. You are basically pushing them around the sky with the sticks. If you let go of the sticks and you're not giving any input, it'll just stop and hover and wait for you. So that's really, really good because uh-huh. it gives you time to, to think and plan. And, you know, you don't panic because it's not heading at full speed towards a tree or something. You know, you just, <laughs> you know, you don't have to, you're not committed to doing something. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I could see how, like, you're talking about, like, hovering eight feet from a thing. If you've got stabilization, hovering eight feet from a thing is a lot less daunting than if you don't got stabilization and you're hovering eight feet from a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely if it, if it was uh, you didn't have stabilization and you're flying a thirty thousand dollar drone, you know, eight feet away from an energized line that supports fifty thousand people, and you're trying to get a good thermal image, that would be very daunting. But even even with stabilization, it was daunting. You know, it's it's. Yeah. It's kind of hair raising. Like, well, I'm flying a very expensive drone next to a 238,000 volt line that's, you know, energized and supporting a huge city of people. And if somehow I get into it, you know, and actually cause an outage, which is kind of unlikely with a drone, actually, it's it's uh, they're not physically big enough. You know, they, yeah, I imagine like, multiple, the drone would be the be the victim there. Yeah, the drone would be the victim, but yeah, which is never never good. You know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, I had insurance on them, and and uh, the biggest. The biggest mitigation, though, is really understanding your, in your mind, you lock in, you have a plan to fly and you fly the plan. So you don't go out there and just figure it out like on the fly, which is like a pun, but you, you, you don't do that. Like you, yeah. you actually have distinct pictures and images to get that you have in mind and you verify that you can actually drop the drone down into those areas. And then you have a plan and you fly that plan only and you get out of there. You know, you don't you don't try fly right down into the obstacle zone. You know where there's tree branches behind you and lines in front of you and guy wires coming down off to one angle, and start cruising around. You just drop right into the area, get your shot, and climb straight out and get out of there because you know it's safe overhead. You just drop from there. Yeah, it makes so you sense. try not. To, yeah, so there's a there's how, certain do, how do you verify that you can get down there? Or do you just have to fly, or do you do you do that like manually or with uh, some kind of measurement equipment like ahead of time in order to prove so, the mission? Google Earth is your friend. If you're a commercial <laughs> drone pilot, you definitely use Google Earth and, and scope. But sometimes the images are not high enough resolution. And there are map services that you can pay, actually, to get uh, much higher resolution imagery, just like Google Earth, uh, for a linear strip. And you can just pay oh, cool. by, by, the, by the actual strip or by acreage. And you define it. You draw like a KML uh, over the area you want and then pay for that. And then you can verify what the condition is out there do you get the data right away or do you have to wait for them to have a satellite over to like get a high resolution capture you get the data right away okay, they've, cool. they've already have they have uh, a lot of, well all the times i've requested i got it right away yeah, so i think some areas maybe you know you might have to wait yeah but i kind of wonder like if they've if that type of high resolution data exists why google maps isn't just using it but maybe their license with whoever their provider is just doesn't doesn't allow for that yeah there's definitely a, a variety of um satellite service you know imagery services that are out there and they they're all relatively new where google earth has been around for quite a long time and so they yeah. i think you google know google earth uses third-party satellite data though is, yeah. is my understanding i i don't know who they're buying off of but I, yeah i've never seen who yeah. um, but i don't know they don't they don't have their own uh satellites you know so they're definitely third party but that's a good tool. And then, of course, uh, driving or walking or, you know, getting out there in person is super valuable. 
And then when you're flying the drone, you're up above the lines and trees and you're looking down with your, you know, your video, your live video stream. And so you build over time, you, you really build an understanding of what kind of distance there is, you know, by that screen, by that image. And you know, okay, I've got nine feet of clearance. I can, I can drop down in here in, this, in the middle of that and, and pivot in place without moving any, in any axis, just literally pivot right on one point. Oh, that's cool. And get my shots and then climb back out again, you know, to how minimize it, risk. How is it localizing? Is it just like a really nice IMU or is it, is it using uh, like GPS? Cause you've got, well, it wouldn't be able to, if you had a nine foot chimney, you're not getting a GPS lock. So that's not it. So GPS is actually really good. Uh, I, I always had amazing amount of satellites, even when uh -huh. I was hovering down, you know, six feet above the ground next to trees and, and transmission line, you know, where I'm half a mile away, you know, or whatever it might be. I'm, I'm very far away down the transmission line corridor and, and I fly over and then I want to go get a picture of the bottom of the pole. So I'll actually drop the drone really low down and, and get that shot. And on my screen, I still have many satellites. You know the the sensors are quite amazing now, and there's a lot of GPS satellites in the sky. From, Even if you're like in like a hole, you can still get that kind of a GPS like connection. So this was, uh, you know, all in the woods and, and out in the wilderness yeah. and, and you know flying semi-urban areas. But when you're flying a drone like down in underground where you open the manhole, yeah, th no those way. that drone doesn't even have GPS. Yeah, it that's what it I doesn't even think. have a sensor. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so, so that one a, relies you have a on specialized drone just for that. Yeah. Yep, That's very specialized cool. drone for indoor stuff. Uh, it has an actual cage around it, a carbon fiber ball that surrounds the entire drone, so it can't even really Sweet. get hurt. So, and it has lights, um, but no GPS because obviously what? it's designed to fly underground. What happens if you crash that thing? Like, didn't you say there was water in the bottom of these? Uh, what's it called? A vault? Yeah, electrical vaults. Yeah, I always had to pump them out, so we got the water down to, you know, an inch or two on the floor usually. Oh, gotcha. And then if you sort of crash. Like you can just take off again because you've got that cage is, is the idea. Hopefully, depending on how the drone is, you know, if or you're up against is. something or whatever, in, or you crashed enough to break it, you know, you can, yeah. but it can take a pretty good drop. I think it's like five feet in, you know, it's total drop and it won't, won't break the cage, carbon fiber cage. Yeah, but yeah, you could, that's yeah, we awesome. always had a um, carbon, we always had a, a fiberglass pole called a shock stick <laughs> and we had a, a hook on the end and we could reach in there and grab it and it's an actual lineman tool that's you know designed to I've be heard about put into chart. Yeah, yep. Because they're non-conductive, and so the idea is that you can you can do stuff with that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can reach into areas that have energized lines and not get hurt. But I never had to use it. You know, thankfully, uh, <laughs> never got stuck. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. The the drone wanders around in the room underground because you know no GPS, and then uh, the, the, all the airflow it's creating is is ricocheting off the walls in that confined space and hitting the drone so it, it wanders around. So you have to really be active on the sticks. It doesn't want to just hover still. Okay, so uh, even so, with, with that, you just got to you gotta kind of watch the, the heck out of it to keep it from trying to crash, basically, because of that. That makes sense. Yeah, it wants to definitely wants to drift into obstacles. It has little tiny sensors on the, on the corners. They're called time-of-flight sensors, and cool. they're infrared yeah. pulses. And so it actually counts time from a pulse going out and hitting the wall and coming back and... Is that one degree of freedom distance. time of flight or are those uh, like two-dimensional time of flight? These are, yeah, just two-dimensional. Okay, that's cool. Yep, but they had multiple ones in there. Um, so half D from the sensor. I don't know. Yeah, so if you are if you took off outside out in the wide open, it, w it wouldn't hold its position at all. It would, want, it would really drift around. But once you're down in a room, as long as there's not too much, uh, it's not as long as it's a big enough room, it will actually hold position relatively well within a couple, you know, a foot of, of wandering around you know, without you moving the sticks. Um, but, you know, if the room was smaller, it could wander a lot more than that and, and crash into stuff. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. There's another uh, version of that drone that's newer now, and it actually has LiDAR on board, and it's doing SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, S-L-A-M. Yep. So this thing, it's it's amazing. So with that LiDAR on board, it's, it's an active laser sensor that scans the room and builds this point cloud of, of millions of points all around the drone that are accurate, these points are accurate in X, Y, Z coordinates to each other. And so they're, that drone is able to hold position much tighter. I got a chance to fly it at the commercial UAV Expo last year. Oh, cool. So flew it inside of a little enclosed trailer. Uh, and it, <laughs> and it, it was like a vault, you know, same size as like a yeah. underground vault. You know, and it, it held position far, far better than its older version. So oh, that's awesome. 
I would imagine less terrifying uh, just because, you know, you have the ability to open the door to the trailer. Yeah. It sounds like it's vendor equipment, so if you crash it, like, it still sucks, but at least it's not your baby. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a chance to break it in that the trailer had uh, sound deadening foam everywhere, so oh, nice. in that small of a space, you could never, you know, break it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. But yeah, that's uh, very powerful because the the LiDAR unit is, is like I said, it's used for the drone for positioning, but it's also a deliverable now. So if you fly down in some mining, you know, some underground mine, you fly a thousand feet into a tunnel and back, You one of your outputs isn't just the images you took, it's also a 3D model of that whole space that is measurable. So, you know, if there's a slope, you could tell the, the company that you're flying for, hey, that slope is 39 degrees and it's 612 feet long and or maybe there's a mound of of, uh, of dirt or something, and you could say, well, that's 21.2 yards of dirt there. You know, you know, you can do volume calculations from that that point cloud. So oh, that's cool. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Is there off the shelf software that does that now? Because I, I remember seeing some startups working on that, like maybe like five, ten years ago, but I haven't looked into it lately for the volume. Yeah, there's definitely multiple companies that have um, the ability to take lidar data and and then generate um, volume stockpiles, you know, stockpile calculations. That's and awesome. tell you what you know how how much dirt or material is there, whether it's gravel or sand or salt or whatever. Yeah, so you can go from above and you can just see the volume of whatever the pile of stuff they've got on the ground is. Yep. Yeah, it'll have this full three D model of it, and then you can run those reports and give the give your customer all that information. You know what they're what they're looking for. That's awesome. That that sounds just like a lot of fun. Um, I'm still, I don't know, the signal attenuation, not to keep going back to it or belaboring a dead horse, as it were, but, uh, <laughs> belaboring it, I'm sorry, but uh, not to keep going back to it, but, like, I just wonder, like, do you ever, is there, like, a commercially available signal repeater that you could use in those underground applications where, like, maybe you drop beacons or repeaters and then you can get deeper down that, that mine shaft or that tunnel? Yeah, so. Is that, is that not a thing? Yeah, right now it's not being done with drones um, that fly underground, but there are mesh network radios. There's a variety of them. And so um, anyone, anyone radio can be function as a repeater. Yeah. And so you could do that. You could actually like mining. I worked with a commercial or a um, very high end mesh network radio company for, for nine months. And so we actually used Boston Dynamics dogs and we had multiple radios on there and other robots and they would drive autonomously with slam into this I, I went out to a underground mine as an old uh old limestone mine and we sent a multi rotor in there and then a husky um clear path robotics yep. makes this skid steer called a husky and then we had boston dynamic spots and so the husky so actually had repeaters had, on the huskies and the spots yep yeah we nice. had repeaters on actually just the husky had all the repeaters and it would drive along and it would drop it had a, a holster of a bunch of the radios oh, and cool. as it went it would just open and drop one battery powered you know sit there on the on the floor and so these things were able to, to map you know over a kilometer of these tunnels that's uh, awesome autonomously so yeah very powerful capabilities um with with uh meshing did you recover the repeaters or were those kind of sacrificial the mission and they just got left there yeah we recovered them these radios nice. are you know twelve thousand dollars per radio so <laughs> very very high end uh, yeah not gonna leave those uh, yeah that's got to be an interesting mechatronic uh, device that, that is able to drop and then recover those. Uh, can you tell me how the recovery system like worked? So in this case, it we was these tunnels were wide show. open and yeah. they, they were wide open and known. So people could just go out and recover them. I don't know that they had a special robotic recovery system. Um, this was all part of the got it you know, testing, you know, in with the colleges. And so, you know, it was it was a control that wasn't uh um, a very dangerous hostile environment, you know, which maybe with mining or, you know, search and rescue, you know, you would send and then maybe you would try to recover them. And if not, you might just so write them off because you just had to grab it basically is what it came down to. Yeah. That yep. Makes sense. <laughs> send them out there and, and tell them, Hey, you're going on a hike, but you know, it was, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was good. They, they were, they were able to run many tests and, and, uh, and, you know, keep on bringing all the radios back and recharge them and, you know, run other other tests. That's awesome. Yeah, it just sounds yeah, it was, like a, like a cool mission. I think Carnegie Mellon was doing something similar to that. Um, not too long ago, it was like the subterranean, uh, some kind of challenge thing. I, I don't know who sponsored it. If it was like a DARPA function or 
It seems like a DARPA. Yeah, DARPA. Yeah. DARPA sub T. Yep. Yeah, DARPA sub training <laughs> challenge. Yep, that was it. That's yeah, they're cool. amazing. Yeah, that was there was multiple teams working on that, and um, actually the team that won was running a uh, robotic dog from a Swiss company. So it wasn't the Unitree, and it wasn't Boston Dynamics. It was a different huh. robotic dog. So pretty cool. What? Which one would that be? Just out of curiosity. It's called the Animal. Animal. I don't know that one yet. Yeah, any A N Y M A L. Animal. That's interesting. I'll have to look that up after this. So yeah, it was a, it was a capable robot dog and then they had their other you know ground vehicles in, in robotic multi you know multi rotors with with slam you know they had the whole range um but yeah they they did they nailed it badass yeah really cool stuff i think that's kind of amazing is is uh the radio side of it i love radios like i always have like you know anything rf you know going way back from when i was little and today what you can do is is you know it just blows me away like even like you said you know you can fly down even with these commercial indoor or confined space inspection drones, you can fly, you know, many hundreds or even a thousand feet into some crazy tunnels and, and stuff and still have a signal and you're on the outside. You might need to attach uh, a signal, re- not a repeater, but an antenna extender to the controller that has the actual antenna ports. It's basically just RF cable that runs down and, and then dangles down into the hole and has oh, the cool. antenna, the directional antenna facing down, you know, so that way you can get a better signal. Um, you, you know, down into the environment that you're going to be operating in. And, but still, it's just amazing how far you can go, you know, what you can do with today's radios. And it's because they, they have such high sensitivity and, and such clean signals. And it's just wild what they can do. That's awesome. And now we have 5G coming online. And I think 5G is actually going to take over our operation um, totally. I think it's going to completely change the, the landscape for, you know, remotely operating vehicles. So you won't even have to be in the same state or country necessarily in order to to do that. Yeah. So the five G system is actually uh, always going to have the four G fallback. It's it's a hybrid. Yeah. So four G LTE, like what we use today, will always be there because it's able to penetrate and wrap around things. That signal is like you know you can you can talk on your cell phone and you're in the basement of a of a house or a multi story building and maybe you're even in the middle and and the true five G five, five the fifth generation cellular system has has tiers or, or phases of rollout. And so when you get to the really high speed ones, it's actually going to run at 29 gigahertz, which is wildly high frequency. Yeah, yeah So agree. any any little humidity in the air will, will attenuate the signal or, or, or mangle the signal and weaken it dramatically. It'll bounce off of everything. It will not, you will not have a 5G signal at 29 gigahertz uh, from outside in your building. There's no way. So it'll yeah. be using 4G. Um, but well, what's going to happen is you're going to see just really, really awesome, um, very, very sensitive antennas and radios, these modules that are, you know, like you said, we talked about earlier, like cell phones like that, that economies of scale and the drive, the money's coming in. So those will be able to be taken out and, and mounted into robots. And oh, cool. you're going to have, you know, depending on where you're operating, you might be running a, a lower, you know, maybe a 4G signal for part of it. And then, you know, maybe if you get in a long straight tunnel, you can you can run a 5G um, 29 gigahertz seal you know, link and you're going to have this, you know, meshing system because that's one of the key parts of 5G is, is it's going to have uh, very mesh, you know, it's going to be a total different structure from the way we think of cell phones today. Instead of many towers that serve a huge area, you're going to have tens of millions potentially, or even hundreds and hundreds of millions of very small nodes that are mounted on top of streetlights and in, in doorways and, and on top of buildings. And they call them, you know, there are, you know, femto cells or, or pico cells based on how small they are. And, and they're going to all be, you know, running uh, a 5g signal. So that's, oh, that's cool. So those that's like coming in. It's going to, yeah, each one's like a little mini cell tower and, or repeater really not a cell tower. It's not going to serve the whole area, but so yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome, and I would think you could mount those teeny little like femto or pico cells like on probably actual drones if you were doing an underground mission, and if you were really coordinated, you could have a bunch of drone pilots, and you could have people like going deeper and deeper into the cave if you had enough mission duration on those drones, and you could just hover, and the drones could be the repeaters, and you could go pretty deep in with like the last one down the line. I don't know. I'm just speculating here, kind of spitballing. Yeah. But yep. That's definitely um, capabilities are talking about doing. And um, there's also 
amazing new battery technology coming that's right around the corner. Um, some of it's already been released. Uh, so um, if you look at batteries, like how much energy it has per density, it's kind of like the key thing, like, you know, how much weight and how much size does it take up for a given amount of capacity? So energy density is really the key. And it's, uh, there's a company right now that has a battery that's 450 watt hours per kilogram. So that's really amazing. Cause like Tesla's cars have 270, I think somewhere on there. Wow. Uh, each battery does, you know, it has 270 watt hours are per kilogram. Are they still using 18650s on those or are they, are they on something different? Yeah, they're running a variety of cells, actually, okay. Tesla is. But they have a, a very big 4680, actually, so it's really it's really cool. It's much bigger. Yeah, that's um, wild. Yep. So these new, uh, this new battery is already being sold. A company that manufactures this battery with such high energy density um, went, and they, they actually IPO'd that, you know, this last year. Oh, nice. So they hit the stock market, and yeah, Sounds they're like doing me. good. I, I might have missed out on an opportunity there. Yeah. <laughs> What's the name of the company? Yeah. It's... Um, uh, all of a sudden, brain fart here. I know where it's. Uh, yeah, weirdest thing. Oh, Amprius. A M P R I U S. Amprius. Interesting. I'll have to look out for those guys. Yep. So they're running like a, a silicon anode um, technology. So uh, part of the reason they can get such high energy density. But that's going to enable a lot of really cool things as it evolves. You know, like you said, maybe you're going to have drones just sitting there hovering along a tunnel, you know, four of them, and one every thousand feet or whatever. And then another one comes well, cruising by. And the other thing you could do, just thinking as like an engineer here, is if you had, you know, like you said, like four of them and you just landed them and then you conserve battery because you're not spinning the rotors, but you still use battery to have it act as a repeater. And then you monitor your state of charge so that you can get out of there before you run out. I mean, you could potentially extend your mission that way. I mean, you still are limited by the amount of battery in the drone that's all the way down running its mission, but I don't know. Maybe yeah. That's, maybe that's yep. something. <laughs> you you might, if you can land, that'd be amazing. But if the floor has some dips and, you know, and you might need to be up oh, in order yeah, to, to get a clear line of sight, yeah. uh, which, you know, always helps, but it's not obviously not critical depending on the signal you're using. So, you know, like the small drone that I was flying down through manholes, you don't, you don't need uh, any kind of line of sight for that. You know, it helps, but I was able to fly, like I said, down a nine-foot chimney and into a 12-foot room. That particular vault was 12 feet long yeah. and fly all the way down to the other end and do a full inspection up, you know, within a foot of, of the uh, assets under inspection, the, the conductors, and still had a good signal up top. It was crazy to me. That's awesome, man. I had a blast doing this, man. I would I would be happy to do this again. When we cut, uh, before we cut, rather, uh, sorry, I'm getting late for me. Is there anything you want to plug or kind of mention here uh, just to leave people with? Um, nothing comes to mind. I guess I didn't really think about that. A job description, company. Uh... All right, no worries. Well, yeah. uh, if you're hiring a drone pilot, <laughs> look no further. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, yep, yeah, I uh, appreciate you coming on, Phil. Uh, thanks for doing this, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SK Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SK Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.